This is Wells Tech, a weekly show exploring the intersections of technology and ministry. Your hosts are Sally Draper and Martin Spriggs. Wells Tech is produced by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Welcome back, everybody, to episode 519 of the Wells Tech podcast, recorded on August, I'm sorry, October 17th, 2017. All these uh, month abbreviations have the same number of letters, so you can see my confusion, Sally. This is October, <laughs> and uh, actually, it doesn't uh, seem like October outside. I went out to lunch, and it was in the lower 60s. How about over there in New Ulm, Minnesota? We're supposed to hit lower 70s today, so I'll send some of that your direction. I'm thinking, though, if you invented some kind of technical thing to turn back time, probably wouldn't turn it back to just August, just a couple months ago. Where would you go in history if you could? Oh, my goodness. She's asking me these deep questions at the beginning of the podcast. Oh, I'd probably, I wouldn't go back as far as, uh, well, in my own life or at any period of time in history? Any period of time. It's your time travel machine, Martin. <laughs> Debbie You're and I were just home. talking about this. Um, we tend to like uh, movies that are based on history. Mm -hmm. And period pieces are, are kind of our favorite because we learn a little bit you know, while we're mm -hmm. watching and whatever. And I think we were both kind of made for um, maybe the early 1800s where things were a lot simpler, um, probably not in this country either, um, maybe Europe someplace, something like that. So okay. like the, 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 the dress uh, you know, of the day, those kinds of things. We're probably very uh, incompatible. We, we live such an easy life. It seems like a much harder life, but uh, right. it, just, it just seemed a little more, um, I don't know, not royal, but... Uh, a little bit more formal, a little more polite. That that fits us, I think, mm -hmm. a little bit better. You may not have so, guessed that about me, but uh, and you about, could have some influence maybe on technology of that time period. That's right. That's, that's right. right. How about a very you? Very pivotal time. I'd go back to the Reformation. Just kind of on a Reformation kick. We've been reading um, Luther's Protest from Northwestern Publishing House. Hey, maybe I've mentioned that before, but interesting time period as well. I know very hard time period, obviously, but oh yeah, um, so good. much like, uh, going like the on. Black Plague and yeah. uh, med medicine was not very good. Life expectancy very, very short. short back in mm -hmm. those days. But goodness, at the amazing Reformation with it the would. religion and, and political atmosphere and then throw in there a printing press to yep. distribute all this great stuff. You think so. you'd be a good Lutheran back then? Yeah. Pretty like cool stuff. I'd have been one of those nuns escaping from the monastery. I think. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, well. Um, well, be that as it may, I think there are, it's fun to think about, but uh, we have to deal with here and now. God has placed us here in uh, 2017 with lots of uh, different challenges and opportunities. And one of the things he's put on our plate is trying to figure out this whole technology thing. And uh, that's why we do this show. And uh, we are focusing on one narrow piece of technology for October, and that's the use of video. So I, maybe it's not so narrow. It's actually pretty big, but it's a, it's a big piece of technology today, whether you're talking mobile, web, or whatever whatever. Uh, and I think, and uh, some may disagree, but I think most would agree, it's a big or will become a very big part of a church or school's ministry plans. I agree um, with you, Martin. I think that we're seeing that move more and more to visual communication. And um, so learning how to generate videos and generating quality videos, having good distribution channels, all of those pieces um, will kind of come together, I think, for churches and schools as part of their um, regular communication yep. plan. If not now, then certainly Pretty in the soon. near future. Yep. I think early 2000s, maybe even the first decade, you know, uh, maybe decade and a half even, 
was kind of the period of the web for a lot of churches and schools, just kind of figuring out what to do with the web. And then toward the latter part of that, social networks and social ministries, um, social media, those kinds of things. And I think it's all kind of evolving pretty quickly in the last few years as you look at things like Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat. Um, they are all very video centric. Um, it's not just words. It's not even just pictures. It's it's talkies. It's picture. It's moving pictures. It's uh, uh, it's really hard to uh, to engage in social media without seeing a lot of video, and I think that is going to play a big part in how. A, how our ministries evolve. It's, it's almost expected, uh, I would think, you know, as you're thinking about how to communicate and where people are gathering. That's one of the reasons we wanted to spend a little bit of time today talking about what do you do with that? Is it just a video that you plop on a web page or you post on Facebook? Or do you need kind of a, a website experience? And there are tools out there on YouTube, Vimeo, Livestream that give you a, a channel or a brand, a place to bring all this together, to give it some context, to give it some organization, to make it kind of a destination where you can send people. So rather than maybe sending people to a web page or a blog or whatever, you're sending them to your YouTube channel or your Vimeo channel where you're collecting uh, good stuff that's in video format. And there, we talked a little bit about content uh, the first week of this series, uh, the first one in October here, but uh, you know that could be anywhere from you know collection of sermons, Bible studies, school events, you know whatever it is, whatever you're capturing on video, uh, can find a, a happy home and a kind of a a good experience in a let's say a YouTube channel, for instance. Yeah, I think channels, like you said, are becoming more and more important. And I guess one aspect of that that just seems to be a little bit more in my face, a little bit more prominent these days is subscriptions to channels. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't mention that fact, but now that I'm subscribed to some of these YouTube or Vimeo channels or whatever, I'm getting reminders when they've posted new um, content. I'm, I'm getting um, on screen, yep. come and join live events kind of messages, you know, in real time. Some community, and so, kind of a community. You know, that whole yep. opting in, allowing your audience to be a part of what you're creating um, is becoming more and more um, popular and yep. powerful. And you throw, you know, and, you know, not to, uh, uh, to, to lean one way or the other, but I think even on the education side, I'm seeing more and more uses for, let's say, YouTube in the educational space. You have teacher channels, you have content-specific channels. Um, there's all kinds of uh, opportunities. And you kind of, you can't think of them, I don't think you can think of these channels as kind of a website equivalent, just with video thrown in. They certainly have that social piece to them like you mentioned so there's subscriptions and there's there's things that you follow and um, you can um, comment and have right you can comment and have dialogue that. around different things and then you can also gather other content in so it doesn't have to be all your own so you curate your own uh, or good playlists or whatever and you're bringing together stuff that other people can come and and find a kind of a good source for so it's a it's a different animal and i think it takes a little bit of getting used to so we wanted to spend a little bit of time today talking about what all what all the options are and maybe the best place to start and maybe the the, the one that's longest in the tooth and maybe the one that has the most to offer is still youtube right yeah, I think um, taking a look at an example channel on YouTube would be a great place to start to just kind of explore how people have it set up. So I've brought up Your Time of Grace, which is a, a video devotion, a short video devotion that's published daily. Um, and it's an offshoot of the Time of Grace ministry from Milwaukee. And I uh, started basically on YouTube. They have over 13,000 subscribers. And I know they publish this content 
on Facebook as well. I'm sure they're probably on other channels as well, but the videos are hosted here on YouTube. So you can see what their channel looks like. Um, it has a channel image at the top. And as the channel owner, you can control that. You can switch it out if you want to put something different. Um, you have a little bit of a logo look with your, um, with your branding there on your page with your little icon that's part of um, your channel. And then you have the ability to put kind of a introductory video that automatically plays when people come to your channel. And that sits right at the top of the home page of your channel. And just, it can be changed out as well, but it's um, got some text associated with it so people can um, read more about your channel and that kind of thing. Um, then, you know, they've included a Facebook link here. You have the ability to link to some of your other channels, um, your other social media um, pre pre um, presences, I guess I would call it. And then they have a subscribe button up there. So if you aren't subscribed, you can easily subscribe. Um, then they kind of feature some of their videos or um, playlists that they've developed, video themes or whatever. But then along the top, there are links to their own list of videos and uh, people can sort it in different ways to kind of find things that are most popular or things that are newest or whatever they're interested in. Um, here are their playlists. And again, you can uh, create your own playlist of your own stuff, or you can create playlists of videos that you like um, from other sources. And yeah, uh, different channels that you subscribe to, discussion around your channel, and information about your channel. So that's kind that's of really just what your users or right. site visitors would experience on your YouTube channel. Yep. And um, you talked about some of the featured videos and those kinds of things. Even uh, there's a lot of settings and we're not going to go through all of them clearly, but uh, just to make people aware, there are lots of different things that you can do on your site that maybe would enhance the experience of somebody playing a video. So you could have a video that plays at the beginning or videos that are featured as uh, associated videos, or you might also like kinds of videos or a video that would play at the end. Um, all kinds of things to, not I, I, advertising is a bad word. I think it's trying to create awareness of different things that your ministry might offer. If somebody stumbles on your video or subscribes to your video, they're going to get, uh, you know, whatever it is that you want to kind of attach to that experience and make make people aware of maybe special services that are coming up or different programs or ministries that are starting or have special things that are going on that you want them to be aware of. So in that respect, very much uh, like a website uh, where you've got the opportunity to kind of give some context and give a little fuller picture of what your ministry is all about. So I think um, the old term is the devils in the details. There are a lot of details mm -hmm. to dig Ton. through. Um, right. We talked about, I think on our most recent podcast last week, uh, that you can kind of go behind the scenes of YouTube if you go to youtube.com slash dashboard. And there in the dashboard channel is one of the options available to you. And when you go into the channel area, that's where you're going to get into a lot of those, um, you know, ability to feature different content and um add branding, like a watermark to all your videos, and then even some advanced capabilities as well. So check out the YouTube dashboard um, and all the different details you can set up about your channel. Yep. And there are good uh, tutorials and those kinds of things out there. And we'll have some links in the show notes to that kind of stuff. One thing that you should be aware of is that there are two different kinds of YouTube accounts. A personal account, which uh, anybody can grab. You just go on and you uh, use your Google login or whatever. Anybody, and in fact, I think this is still true. If you have a Google Plus account or Google account, you, you automatically have a, a YouTube account. They've kind of put that together. But then there's also brand accounts. And that's kind of a different animal. And anybody with a YouTube YouTube account can set up a brand account and that's the recommended approach for maybe your organization. So don't, uh, I guess 
look, reading what I read, and you know, maybe you know, there's YouTube experts out there that would tell me different. But the best way to set up your brand or your organization would be not to have your organization have a its own YouTube account, but set up that brand for them, and then that comes with different things. So uh, it just makes a little bit more sense to to call your organization a brand rather than have its own YouTube account. And that's something that we did wrong when we set up Wells Tech. We just got our own. Uh, Gmail account and then uh, a YouTube account came along with that and we should probably disclaimer this whole conversation is we don't do a very good job of our YouTube channel it just is simply there to receive our recorded videos and then we post them over on um, the, the Wells YouTube channel which they do a much better job than we do and primarily we use Vimeo or the Synod uses Vimeo for most of their kind of long-term and advertised videos, which we probably should talk a little bit about Vimeo as well, right, Sally? Great lead and Martin. I actually have Vimeo, uh, the Wells account on Vimeo up on my screen right now. And uh, what you're going to see when you go to uh, our channel or our account on Vimeo is a listing um, of the most recent videos as a default. Um, a little bit of a description about the account at the top of the page and then it tells you how many videos and followers and likes and things like that you have. Um, I guess I should probably log out to get the true effect. True experience, right. Um, but you can um, easily get to um, different uh, splits on your videos. So there are what albums, channels, and groups that you can set up um, on Vimeo. And so you can organize your videos pretty well um, with those different uh, splits of the, the way that you add them. So things like channels, um, I think we have several different channels set up and they go to that page. Um, and that's, that's actually a channels page for all of Vimeo where you can see different um, channels across the board uh, kind of aggregated there. But I know Wells does have a channels page. I just don't have the proper um, setup right now to show that to you. So. Um, so yeah, albums, channels, groups, those are all part of how Vimeo has organized things. So you got to kind of pick your, your pony and, and uh, figure out how you want to live there. And I would say that the, uh, the, maybe the major difference between YouTube and Vimeo is uh, going to be the amount of traffic that you might receive. YouTube, I think, is going to have a lot more traffic, uh, but it comes with its own baggage, too. But uh, Vimeo, I would say the quality of Vimeo's videos are excellent, and the, the ease of use is, is good as well. Since we post to both, uh, we do have a little bit of experience there. One thing that we should probably discuss before we leave the topic is the... Um, concept of live streaming and uh, the Synod uses that, Wells uses live stream as well, livestream.com and there are a number of live streaming um, different tools and technologies out there. Uh, but this kind of can serve both purposes. You can record your videos as you live stream it. So those of you that have events like a, you know, a Sunday morning worship or uh, for a school, whatever that may be, uh, there are opportunities to obviously stream that live, but then also make it available in an on-demand fashion. And we've got uh, you know, one good example of that is Martin Luther College, where they have uh, a channel that they stream a lot of their events on. And uh, they've done a nice job at uh, kind of making that a, kind of a pleasing experience with different uh, um, different categories. I don't know what live stream calls them, but uh, you can group uh, group your events and or your on-demand videos into to little categories. Yeah, actually, um, I had a hard time figuring out that category thing on live stream, but it's actually events. Okay. Um, when you add a new live stream, you're adding an event, but you can add the event to an existing event. So it's kind of odd. For instance, they have an event called Morning Chapel. And when you go to Morning Chapel, you see all the different live streams archived there. Mm -hmm. um, as well as any time a new live stream happens for that event, um, then you would be able to watch it live from that event page. So um, I, I looked and looked for albums or, or collections or whatever, and I just didn't find it. But what I finally realized was 
they're all specific events and then there's live streaming happening within those events so that's right. how they do that I we should point out organization yeah we should point out that for a live stream either you do have a limited shelf life for your videos if you are not a paying customer so live stream is one of those where if you do a lot of it and you, you think you're going to get some viewership and traffic, it's probably worth the the, the, uh, the amount that you'd pay for it. But it's not inexpensive, so you, uh, you want to make sure that, that, that it's going to be worthwhile for you too. YouTube and Vimeo both have, uh, Vimeo especially does have a subscriber model as well, but it's much cheaper. Um, and they've just started doing live stuff too. Uh, but it comes with a pretty good price tag, as I, as far as I can tell, too, and that's pretty that's pretty new. Yep. So one of the things you might want to do is create some of those images to feature on your channel, just to kind of tie together your brand appeal and everything, making sure that your channel images look nice. And a couple of different image editors are geared towards specifically towards um, YouTube channel and imagery um, or at least one have of templates them, Martin, for them yep mm -hmm. is photor you talked about photor as a potential replacement for pick monkey have you made use of it uh yes and i've got my student my uh uh Ari lutheran high school online students using it as well and um, it truly does uh, does a nice job in online experience for um image uh creation and uh, like i mentioned there are uh templates for different um, sizes of uh, images. So if you you can, I think, pick, uh, let's say, the YouTube header size or Vimeo or Facebook or whatever it is. So that gives you a nice start for just kind of getting the, the, the dimensions correct. And then they give you some suggested images that you could use and just kind of a nice get you going so you're not staring at a blank screen trying to figure out what do I put in this space. Um, mm -hmm. So they kind of cater toward those, uh, those channels and getting you looking as good as possible with, their, with the stuff they've got, so. Nice. Very easy way to go. Um, another one worth mentioning is Adobe Spark. And uh, they even specifically have a YouTube channel art maker. Yep, big button um, there. Feature. Create your YouTube channel mm -hmm. art. Yes. So it's an obviously an button. Adobe product. And so you have to have an Adobe account to get logged in. And once you do, apparently they help you get it to just the right dimensions and perhaps add some overlay text and that kind of thing to it. Exactly right. So they try and make it easy. And there are other tools out there, but those are just a couple of examples. So you're not kind of left to, to swim out there by yourself. You've got some, some helpers. Good deal. Sally, I think we've exhausted that topic. Good stuff there and something that um, you're not going to do overnight, but you probably want to get on your radar. Um, you know, kind of like that same website strategy that we were talking about at the beginning, that uh, there's some strategy here as well, especially as you're getting into video, producing video, uh, curating video, whatever it is that you're, you're going to be doing with it. Um, yeah, that's good. Next week, I'm looking forward to, we'll kind of give a little tease here. We're going to be interviewing some people who know a lot more about video than we do. Stephen Beth Zambo, um, Salty Earth Pictures from Steve's perspective. And he's going to, we're going to do a little interview with him and his wife, Beth, and talk about uh, some production tips and techniques and uh, preparation and planning and uh, promotion, which is really where Beth plays in her work uh, currently with the Committee on, it's not Committee on Relief, CARE, a, uh, Committee on Aid and Relief, is it, isn't that it, CAR? I forget what the I'm acronym like is, but uh, <laughs> I stumbled yeah. right through that, Beth. I'm so sorry. We'll get that right when you join us next week. But uh, So I'm really excited about getting some professionals on the show and talking to us about video stuff. So tune in next week for that. Definitely. All right, Sally, um, we should move along. Probably should have moved along about three minutes ago. <laughs> News and tech, what's happening in the technology? Move along world? or go back in time. I'm, I'm kind of on the bubble right now, but okay. yeah, we'll move into the future. And uh, just recently there were um, 
some interesting tech stories that caught our eye. The first was in relation to a tablet product. And this is called uh, the Amazon Fire HD. Let's see if I can share my screen. We came across a review from CNET that gave it pretty good accolades. Uh, it's a big 10 inch tablet. So we're talking comparable to the, iPad. to the iPad Pros that, mm -hmm. that are a large format for tablets and uh, got a really great review at 8.2 out of 10. So almost um, up there to five stars and, um, it does push you, it says, toward Amazon services, uh, making uh, some other media options harder to find and use, but um, still very, very well uh, reviewed and starts at $150, which is- Half the price half the of an price. iPad, yeah. Yeah, of, of the 9.7 inch and it's 10 inches. So if you're looking for a good entry-level tablet, this might be one that uh, you would enjoy with the larger screen. Yep, I've had a, uh, for testing, I've used, I don't use it on a day-to-day -day basis, but I've used one of the Fire HD, the smaller ones, I think the seven inch one. And credible, and this is like five years ago now that uh, that I purchased, it's still going strong. And I think for what it does, uh, does a nice job. And at a great price point, I think that one was under a hundred bucks. So it's, uh, they've got some low price points and obviously they're making their money, not so much on the hardware, but the services, you know, the books that you would buy or the products that you would buy through their, through their tablets. So kind of like a flat little uh, shopping cart for them. Mm -hmm. And then one oh, more wait, article more. from TechCrunch um, posted last week, Facebook's new virtual reality strategy, self-reliance, it says. So uh, Facebook bought Oculus, which was the virtual reality headset to, that kind of set the ago. standards for VR. Mm -hmm. And now they've made announcements that they're coming out with a, a cheaper version, a $199 version called Oculus Go. And another high-end one that'll be a, um, uh, coming out soon, the Santa Cruz. But um, ultimately, it's got its own power button, it says. Um, so controlling the end-to-end -end experience. So you can read more. I think this is worth mentioning, not that everybody's going to rush out and spend $200 on a VR headset, but just that these big companies are definitely investing in, you know, artificial intelligence and virtual reality and things like that. They do see it as a movement of the future. And so we should definitely be, you know, keeping up with the developments there and, and monitoring what's going on with those yep. kind of tools. What's especially in education, I think that's where mm -hmm. the sweet spot would be. I think for ministry, at least in our circles, what's been your experience with VR? Have you done much with it? Um, beyond getting the Google Cardboard and experimenting some with that a few years back, like I haven't tried it lately. Stuff, yeah. <laughs> um, but I do think, you know, well, I shouldn't say that. It's not really VR, but while I was at MLC, we had someone come and do the 360 degree photography tour. And you can play those in a VR headset, you know. And so I think more and more of that let people experience your your environment kind of thing um, will will come into play for us. Yep. We're going to have Jason Schmidt on in a couple of weeks. We should ask him that same question. I'm sure he's got some interest in that in uh, in the school system uh, that he works side. with. So. Sure. Cool. All right. Uh, speaking of news, Wells now has some news, and this is something we've been uh, – quote unquote advertising the last few weeks, and that's the Interactive Faith series. Luther's Lasting Impact is the current series that's going on. It's a six week series. We're in week, I think we're in week four, week three or four, I forget which. Uh, Wednesday night, six and eight p.m. Central Time. Wells.net slash interactive faith. It's an hour long. You can choose either session. Uh, the encouragement is to gather with other uh, people to enjoy it uh, or at your church or home or whatever. Uh, it's led by Professor Joel Otto and um, uh, perfect timing uh, the topic with uh, Reformation season. He's doing a nice job talking about how uh, Luther impacted um, life then and now in a lot of different ways, uh, 
uh, with his translations, which was the topic last week. We'll be talking about his music, um, all, his catechism, all those kinds of topics, uh, really kind of drill, do a deep dive on that kind of stuff. So tune in if you are available Wednesday nights at 6 or 8 Central Time. And yeah, go to that link, not just to find the live stream, but also to download the study guides so you can follow along with yep. them as well. Yeah, and those are well done too. Excellent. Sally, it's that time in the show where we do our picks or tips of the week. Uh -huh. And it is that time of the year where we talk about gospel outreach with media. Or maybe we talk about that all year round, Martin, but in particular, our friends um, from the Christ, Christ and Media uh, Institute, and media Institute uh, which originates out of Bethany Lutheran College and is headed by Dr. Tom Custer. Uh, they have come up with an online conference format. And I think they did two of them in 2016. This year they are launching the Gospel Outre Outreach with Media online conference uh, for 2017 next Monday, October 23rd. Mm -hmm. And you can get to the conference at gowm.org. And beginning next Monday, there'll be a whole host of people talking about uh, just that very topic, gospel outreach with media. There'll be some special presentations um, with the Reformation anniversary um, in, you know, as the focus. And then there'll be just some other general um, presentations as well, one of which it turns out is done by me. It's Wonderful. Wells Tech's Gospel Outreach Discoveries. And so um, it was really neat experience to pull together um, this article for discussion during the GOWM conference, uh, looking back at 10 years almost, Martin, of, of gospel outreach that we've talked about using technology. And so there's some real gems and I'm looking forward to sharing it with folks as part of the conference, but this, don't come uh, just for me, come year, for all these other great artists. Done this. Okay. Um, yeah, I did it, I think it was last year. Last fall. A lot uh -huh. of fun. Yep. A lot of fun and a uh, so. neat format where it's a kind of a, uh, asynchronous process where you're putting this out and people come in, read, uh, post, and then you know, there's discussions that go on throughout the, you know, the time period that it's available. And then uh, the, those discussions are archived. So a lot of fun. Excellent. So, All right. Uh, my pick of the week is uh, a blog post and it is related to uh, YouTube of all things. And uh, this this is kind of the mother of all blog posts. <laughs> At the top, this is from uh, HubSpot, blog.hubspot.com marketing. It's called 20 YouTube Tricks, Hacks, and Features You'll Want to Know About This Year. And at the top, it's just kind of neat. They give you a little read time, 32 minute read. And I would say it's at least 32 minutes. So I would say spend, uh, you know, block out a couple hours or morning or afternoon with this article because they really uh, have some, some stellar stuff here. Um, I'll just give you some examples of some of the things they talked about, talk about. You can create a link that starts a YouTube video at a certain time. I knew that, but I didn't quite know how to do that. Sometimes you want to share something with somebody, but you, you don't want to give them the whole video. You can actually say start at X you know, minutes and uh, that link is created and then uh, they will click on the link and it'll start right where you want them to see. You can easily see the written transcripts of people's videos. Help your video get found in search by editing or uploading a transcript. We talked about that, I think, a couple weeks ago. Use YouTube to easily get free transcripts of your videos and audio files, so they will transcribe it for you. Create, share, and collaborate on video playlists. Uh, let's see. There's all kinds of screenshots here. You can save videos to watch later. I think we knew that. Create your own custom YouTube URLs. Uh, could be handy, especially if you're uh, printing those URLs in some kind of fashion in a newsletter or whatever. Add clickable links to your videos, uh, which is kind of cool. I can imagine that. I can envision that maybe in uh, maybe a pastor's sermon or a Bible study where you're linking to more material or Bible passages. You can also add an end screen or cards to promote content. We talked a little bit about that at the top of the show. Uh, just all kinds of stuff. So you'll you'll be uh, 
I think you'll be impressed by the things that YouTube can do and how uh, this really kind of explains the feature and uh, gives you screenshots and additional links. Um, just kind of uh, a, a cornucopia of different things that you might, I think, will find very useful if you are especially setting up a, a YouTube channel or something like that. So uh, again, that the name of the article is 20 YouTube Tricks, Hacks, and Features You'll Want to Know About This Year. So 2017 is the, the year of YouTube. October is the year of video on Wiles Tech. So take a look at that ministry, or not ministry resource, but my pick of the week. Speaking of ministry resources, Sally Draper is up at the plate this week. And, and I'm really excited about week. your ministry resource this week. <laughs> I do have a ministry resource. I said last week I had absolutely no clue what it was going to be. And here I am delivering. So you don't have much uh, expectation. This could be a good one, though. And it ties right into that Reformation anniversary. I realized that I had developed something. Actually, my husband and I developed something last year, thinking ahead to the Reformation anniversary and kind of coming off the kick of escape rooms that we were enjoying last year. Um, we had developed kind of a, a puzzle a group puzzle experience, uh, maybe like um, quasi escape room or amazing race or something like that. But basically the premise of the puzzle is that you've met up with Luther's dog and Luther really did have a dog. His name was Topol and Luther wrote about him um, occasionally throughout his writings, um, considered him a great companion. And Luther's dog is actually going to give you a tour of Wittenberg where you're going to get clues. <laughs> Luther's dog has an umlaut in his name too. I like that part. Yeah. <laughs> different places around the city, you'll, you'll find different clues and solve puzzles and cryptic messages, um, crosswords, um, Bible references, hymn references, lots of fun things um, related to um, Luther and Lutheran history, Reformation history, built into this, um, I'd call it a historical fiction event. And you can do this with pretty much any age group. Um, certainly it would be appropriate for upper elementary through high school classrooms or youth groups or Sunday schools, that kind of thing. You could do it as a part of a fun Reformation celebration or um, just as a family game night, whatever you want to do. I would say there is reading involved. So as clues are discovered, there's a good bit of reading to kind of orient people to things like um, the university or um, Luther's catechism, different things like that. And so um, you'd want to have a strong reader. Little kids will probably understand it fairly well, be able to follow along for the most part, but someone needs to be able to read within the group in order to get the most out of the puzzle. So basically a free download. There's a, a download for instructions, and I give you a real caution. If you read the instructions, you're not going to have fun solving the puzzle. So only one person should read that instruction packet. The and then there maker, are puzzle yes. resources to print, and um, all the instructions cover exactly what you're supposed to do to set up for um, your group puzzle event. So it's, it's free for the download, and definitely hope you enjoy it. We'd love to hear feedback if you uh, make use of it. Let us know how it goes and uh, whether you solved all the puzzles with Luther's dog, Topol. Yeah, I love that what you've done with that. I like the uh, the age range, 8 to 108. Uh, <laughs> so if you fall within that, you're okay. And yeah. I was wondering how you got such a nice color picture of, of Topol. Topol. Is that how you say it with the umlaut? Not, well, I don't know. With the L in there, it could be a little bit... Uh, could be a funny. Yeah, but, I should have asked Stanley. He's my German expert, my oldest. Um, so Luther had a lab. Is that what you're telling? Apparently, us? it was it was known to be a golden retriever. Golden retriever. And, okay. Yeah, yeah and uh, we we found this ancient picture of it and had to include it in the. <laughs> yeah, something Very like nice. that. That's my you've story. Done, I'm sticking to you've it. Done. You've done well with your ministry. It's a lot of fun, I think, and so we'd love it if people try it out. All right, Luther's dog. Reformation. If, you, if there's not, if there's never been a time, a good time for this, this is the time. So now is the time. Five hundredth anniversary That's of right. the Reformation. Um, thank you. Well done, Sally. 
We've got some other resources to share, though, and these come from the Wells Tech community and um, some good ones this week. What week doesn't have good ones? We always have good ones. What a great community we have. We do. Of course you meant that, I know. Um, I am going to share my screen again because uh, I have up on screen now uh, AV Solutions HDMI adapter ring with four adapters. So we heard from... I want to say the gentleman's name was Roman Johnson. Roman Johnson. He's at Shepherd of the Lakes in Fairmont, Minnesota. Woot woot for Minnesota, close by. And uh, he wrote to say that uh, this would have been better suited for your meeting series, but I'm sending it over anyway. Maybe you need to use adapters to show video in your church or school. So totally appropriate this month as well, Roman. Um, the adapter set attaches to the projector HDMI cord with adapters to accommodate most any laptop or display situation. It's ideal for meeting rooms. It actually securely uh, it attaches securely to the cord, so it's there for the next meeting without being lost or misplaced. And I had to smile at that lost or misplaced part because I remember um, challenges there at the CMM. You often have people come in for different meetings and maybe walk out with a remote control or something. So you always have to keep tabs on where all those little meeting room type uh, hardware uh, disappears to or whatever. But this one's not going to disappear on you. It's basically attached, screwed on to your existing cable and gives you lots of different input um, capabilities. Everything from looks like HDMI, DisplayPort, um, even perhaps different size VGA. HDMI, right? Mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of uh, computers or Surface tablets, whatever, all have different size HDMI inputs or or uh, display ports and this would uh, come in handy so this i think gives you four four mm -hmm. different options and uh, kind of a, a dog collar approach where it gets attached like you mentioned <laughs> you can shove these things on i'd say it's a little expensive i'd like to maybe do a little research and see if you could kind of do a diy it yourself for a little bit cheaper you'd probably need a drill and you know some kind of cable to to get it through the uh, the adapters but 100 and what was it 108, 108, I think it is. 108 bucks for that. Yeah, these it's drilled off to the side. These are specially designed for yes, this. Yes, I so, see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Little known fact, I'm the AV guy here in the building. I don't know how that happened, but some of these things kind of interest me because it is an ongoing battle to kind of keep cables straight and, you know, they're, they get abused and lost and they move around and just a nightmare. So anything that helps, and I'm sure there's a lot of our listeners who – have the same responsibility. It seems like technology and AV go together. Um, this might be a help to you. Yeah, it reminded me of our recent comment. Um, and boy, I'm drawing a blank. I'm so sorry. But the guy that had been to Senate convention and was wanting to show a presentation, Jim Bauer is his name. Um, from up near Brainerd, Minnesota, and he said he had his presentation already, and he got to church, and it didn't have the right kind right. of Right, that was just last week or two display. weeks ago, yeah. But because it was in the cloud, he was able to switch to a different computer and make use of it. So, you know, it's a real problem. If you do any presenting anywhere, you would appreciate having, you know, all these adapters at your disposal. So, good yep. stuff. All right. Um, can we move on? Perry Lund, a uh, friend of the show, uh, and Office 365 evangelist of sorts uh, up at Evergreen Lutheran. Uh, uh, I don't know if he sent this to the show, but he posted it on the Wells Office 365 Schools um, Google, Google Plus group or community, I think they called them. Um, and he found a video using Office 365 as your instructional technology platform and uh, I would uh, I watched a piece of the video very well done I think he's uh, he's got experience here as well but there as there's so many products out there when you talk about things like and he's a big OneNote fan we talked a little bit about that a couple of weeks ago um, using OneNote in the classroom you know obviously the whole office suite and SharePoint uh, OneDrive Things like Sway and video and all kinds of tools that you can put together are really neat 
uh, educational experience. And the good news is that it's very inexpensive to bring that into the classroom, especially for our for our schools, uh, being nonprofits, you have uh, a couple things going for you as well. So uh, you've got to kind of get smart on it. And uh, Perry is very good about uh, pushing these things out there so that uh, we do get smart on it and take advantage of that. Definitely. It's not, doesn't have to be all Google. Yeah, that's right. And so that's just one video. We're up to video of the week. And I think we'll um, include a couple of others to join that because we had some more community feedback that was all video centric. And it was from Michael Liger, who's a fifth and sixth grade teacher at Risen Savior in Mankato, Minnesota. And Michael, we really appreciate you writing to us. Um, he shared with us a YouTube channel of all things. And since we talked YouTube channels, uh, I have it up on my computer here. It's called Explaining Computers and seems to be very popular. I've never heard of it. The guy um, has like a British accent. I would assume he's from Great Britain, but I don't know that for sure. But um, over 230,000 subscribers. So he must do a really good job explaining computers. It says it's uploading every Sunday. So he's putting out a lot of videos and uh, doing a good job at it. A couple that, um, that Michael shared with us were um, one about a video software product that is a free open source video editor. It's called DaVinci Resolve. And it's so funny, like the day I got this email from Michael, my husband was working on a video for church and he told me he found this open source video editor and showed it to me, DaVinci Resolve, totally free. And you can pay for a premium version, but um, it, it's very powerful without paying for it. And, and this um, explaining computers video goes into all the different capabilities of the software. So if you're looking for a video editing solution, one that we missed last week when we were going over this, Martin, uh, on the show, you might want to check out DaVinci Resolve. Um, and I think there are a few links um, in the comments and things to be able to get to um, the software download. And then a second video that he shut that he shared from explaining computers is one on using the Raspberry Pi plus a Google AIY voice kit. And so I had to look up what Google AIY was, but it's basically instead of DIY, it's artificial intelligence yourself, do it yourself, artificial intelligence. And uh, they're putting together a lot of these different maker type toolkits um, in this realm. And they've only come out with this one so far. It's called the voice kit, but more projects are coming soon, according to the AIY projects dot with Google dot com page. Um, you can pre order this, I think it's supposed to be out by the end of the month at most, most of the United States retailers. Apparently it was out a little bit earlier in the UK and it's already sold out there, but you can pre-order it through Micro Center or Adafruit. They both have it for pre-order. Price is $25 and it's a, a cardboard box device um, and a what they call a hat, a, a piece of hardware that sits on top of the Raspberry Pi, connects to the Raspberry Pi, and it turns your Raspberry Pi into a Google Home device, basically. Comes with a microphone board and a speaker and a button, a power button that lights up, and you build it in this cardboard box. Um, and this Micro Center offer has it for $25, or you can buy the Raspberry Pi bundled with it. So Ras Raspberry Pi Extra. The Raspberry Pi is extra. It's not included with the Google kit, but if you buy it bundled, you can get them both oh, for $35. 35 bucks. That is and awesome. Huh? Have a Google Home device, mm -hmm. um, artificial intelligence. So definitely check out the video. Um, this guy does a great job of showing how to put it all together and how it works and everything um, on his video. And yes, Michael. This sounds think, like a Draper project. Like it's written all over it. <laughs> I think it. you sold us. I think one will be coming home to the Draper household in the very near future. So stay tuned for that, folks. Very cool. Is that it for uh, community feedback? That's it for community feedback and videos of the week. That's it for all that good stuff. Oh, that included the video of the week, too. Okay. Yeah, not one, oh, but three right. of them. 
<laughs> Let's remind everybody that uh, if you'd like to get in on the fun and the community feedback, that is very easy to do. Go to our website, wellstech.wells.net and leave a note on one of the uh, shows there. Uh, that's where all our show notes are. You could send us an email, wellstech at wells.net, or visit the many social networks that are out there, Google+, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram, Digo. Uh, we have a Wells Tech Google group, uh, fairly active. If you want to uh, ask a question, it will probably get answered out there as well. So lots of different, well, there's, I forgot voicemail. There's a little blue bar on the right side of the screen says send a voicemail. We haven't had a voicemail in a while. So if you you know, want to uh, kick the tires on that just to make sure it still works, uh, that'd be awesome. Uh, we'd love to hear your voice. And whether it be a comment, question, suggestion, we don't care. Um, just uh, just talk to us. We, we're happy when that happens. So it's not just me and Sally talking to each other. That's We've done that uh, 500 and what are we? Five, 519 times. So yeah. I think that they should tell us where in history they want to go back to. That's a great challenge. You know, we'll make that what a challenge kind of for episode 520. Um, tell us where in time and why you'd like to go back. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Sally, for your work. And uh, we will do this all again for episode 520 next week. Bye-bye, everybody.